So we are in uh, the last section of Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, so if you'd turn there. And for the last three years of the anchor, I've been preaching out of the New American Standard Bible. And if you went and bought a New American Standard Bible, please forgive me right now, because we're switching to the ESV, the English Standard Version. All right? It makes all those Reformed guys out there super happy, <laughs> the hipsters. So we're going to be in the ESV. Uh, so I've, uh, I've taught out of the ESV often, but I didn't have a good Hebrew-Greek lexicon in the ESV. So that's I did in the NASB. But anyway, so we'll be in the ESV. So if you've got... One of those Bibles, I'll refund your money for you or something. <laughs> Otherwise, it's probably on your phone anyway. So who buys Bibles anymore? Anyone in here? I do. I like Bibles. <laughs> Too many of them. All right, so Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Matthew 5, 43 through 48, ending this section of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, his final saying here, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the title of this morning's message is agape. So you know that's the Greek word for uh, something, Roman. There we go. For uh, godly love, agape. There's four words in the Greek language for love. Uh, you've heard that explained probably. I'm not going to go into that, but it's the word agape. So it's impossible to love our enemies without this kind of love. It's absolutely impossible to do. And, and I would hope that this morning you would be willing to start the process of forgiving and loving and praying for your enemies and for those who persecute you. That that would be the message of Jesus. That's what he says. He plainly says it. And we know that we cannot do that with just plain human love. It would be impossible to do. So we need agape to be able to do it. So what does the Bible say here about hating your enemies? Hating your enemies. It says, verse 43, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So Jesus, once again, you have heard it said. Where had they heard it said that you shall love your neighbor but hate your enemy? Where would they get this from? Why would Jesus say this? Well, he's taking this from Leviticus 19.18, but I want you to follow along. All the other passages that we've been reading kind of indicate when Jesus says, you have heard it said. But in this passage, it does not indicate this. So listen to what the passage says in Leviticus 19.18. You shall not take, this is God, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Where in the world did Jesus get you have heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Where did he get that from? It, uh, Jesus knows the Old Testament. We know he knows the Old Testament. He knew that that's not what the Old Testament taught, that, you, that in the Old Testament times you could love your neighbor but hate your enemy. He knows that. He knew Leviticus 19.18. Was he somehow setting up the religious leaders, the Pharisees? Was he setting them up somehow when he says this? Why does he say this? What would his audience have been thinking when they heard this said, when they were accused of this? Because this is not what was said. It's not what was said. So where did Jesus get this idea that the Pharisees had heard it said, hate your enemies? Where did Jesus get this idea? Well, here was the problem with the Pharisees. They made up their own laws on top of God's actual law. They added to God's law. And Jesus knew this when he rebukes them. He knew this. Jesus rebukes them again in Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 14. He says this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, these religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works that they actually do. 
For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. For example, they added 39 different categories to keeping the Sabbath holy. The Ten Commandments says, keep the Sabbath holy, and Jewish tradition and the religious leaders and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they added 39 different categories. Here's just a few of those categories of what it means or what, how they interpreted to keep the Sabbath holy. That they could not plow the earth on the Sabbath. They couldn't even spit on the Sabbath. If they spit on the Sabbath, it was considered tilling the ground, plowing the ground. So they weren't, that was a sin if you spit on the Sabbath. You couldn't uh, do sowing or reaping. You could not knead bread. You couldn't bake. You couldn't shear wool, washing wool, making two different loops with some yarn, weaving two threads together, separating two threads, tying something together or untying it. Sewing stitches, writing two or more letters, or erasing two or more letters in the alphabet, that was a sin. Building or demolishing, extinguishing a fire, or kindling a fire. These are just a few that they added of what it meant to keep the Sabbath holy. So Jesus knows this, and he knows this is what happened in Leviticus 19.18. Because listen to what Leviticus 19.18 says that Jesus is referring to when he rebukes the the religious people, he says, this is what it actually says, Leviticus 19.18. Not to take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the Pharisees interpreted this as they were to love their own people, love your own people, and just because we love our own people, then God must be saying or giving us permission, if we love our own people, we're allowed to hate our enemies. This is their misinterpretation, that they could actually hate their, own, uh, hate their enemies. They were, hate, they were to hate those that were not their own people. Love your own people, but hate those people who are not your own people. That's where Jesus gets this from. So the, the Pharisees, they added to and they manipulated God's word. They manipulated it to fit their own needs. So nowhere in this did God say, hate your enemy. God never said that. This is why Jesus says, you've heard it said. Their tradition had said this, but God had not said this. We'll do this a lot. We'll change the rules a lot, right? We change the rules a lot to, to what? To fit our own agenda. Maybe because of our own selfish pride, we'll change the rules. We do this with stop signs, right? We'll do this with a stop sign. It says stop, but we interpret it as yield, Right? It really means to yield. It means stop for someone else, but for me, it means to yield. We'll do this with a, the speed limit. When it says 60 miles an hour, we say, we say, well, that's 60 miles an hour for those who are not very good drivers, but for me, it doesn't apply. So that's for people who aren't very safe, but for me, it doesn't apply. And then what do we do? consistently when we have these rules and we add to them and we make them fit our own selfish desires, our own selfish pride, what do we do? We cry foul when what? When someone else breaks them. When someone else breaks them, oh, all heck is broke loose. Well, what are they doing? They can't do that. And this is exactly what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees manipulated and changed God's word and changed the law to fit their own needs. But boy, as soon, as soon as someone else broke it, boy, they cried foul. And they sometimes didn't even keep it themselves. That's what they did. They would have somebody else carry these heavy burdens, and then they were refusing to do it themselves. This is why Jesus says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say to you, which we're going to get to in a minute. So they had made these man-made laws over and above God's law. They added their own interpretations to fit their needs and their pride. So is it okay to hate your enemies? Well, we might say, well, what about David? What about David and the King David in the Psalms? What about his son Solomon in the Proverbs? Over and over, we, we hear them and we see them hating their enemies. What about these imprecatory prayers of David. It's these prayers that condemn his enemies, these prayers of cursing others. What about those? David did it. It's in the Bible, right? Here, here's uh, one that David says. 
He says, oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against, uh, against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. David frequently cried out, God, just rain your judgment on these people. Wipe them off the face of the earth. I hate them. So isn't this okay for us to do? Isn't this okay for us to hate those who hate God? To hate our enemies? Isn't that what David did? Isn't it in the Bible? Well, no. It's not okay. And yes, it is in the Bible, but no, it's not okay. This is what Jesus is saying. First of all, David did this, and one thing to keep in mind is David didn't know the Messiah. The Messiah had not come yet. He only knew about a Messiah, a hopeful Messiah, but the Messiah had not come yet. Jesus had not come yet. Jesus hadn't come with the law of grace yet. So David had only hoped for this. He didn't know the Messiah. And for another thing, not everything in the Bible is prescriptive in nature. Not everything in the Bible is a prescription, meaning to do. Often the Bible, if you read it in its context and you read it in its proper genre, it's description. It simply describes what happened. For example, Solomon had multiple wives. The Bible is describing that Solomon had multiple wives. It's not prescribing, praise God, that we should have multiple wives. I'm barely man enough to have one wife. I can't imagine having multiple wives. It's a description of Solomon. It's not a prescription of what to do. So David's imprecatory prayers, his prayers of cursing, are a description of what he did. It's not a prescription for us to do that. Why? Because the Messiah says, Jesus says, no, 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 no. You do not hate your enemies. You don't even have to hate those who hate me. So for us in the New Testament era, Jesus has come. What does the New Testament shout? The New Testament shouts, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Leave vengeance up to God. That's what the New Testament shouts. And it shouts, love your enemies. God will take care of the rest. God will take care of the rest. You don't have to hate your enemies. You don't have to hate people who curse God. God will take care of that. Love your enemies and love those who persecute you, as Jesus is going to say here in a minute. So the Asbury Bible Commentary says this, Beyond these instructive appropriations, talking about these imprecatory prayers, these, these prayers of David of cursing, he says, Beyond these instructive appropriations, the imprecatory prayers must point the followers of Jesus beyond themselves to a loftier vision of prayer for not against the enemy a form of prayer taught by our master here in Matthew chapter 5 and modeled by the earliest church in 1 Peter chapter 2 the commentary continues this vision does not set aside the call for justice and vindication but places these matters in God's hands for the end times, for the eschaton, for the end times. Leaves it to God. So this is the law of grace is what Jesus is saying. This is the law of grace. And this leads us to verse 45, that we leave justice up to God. We leave justice up to God. So look at the second part of verse 45. The second part of verse 45, chapter 5 of Matthew says this. This is why Jesus says, for he makes his son, not Jesus the son, this is the son, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So two things to note here. This is an example of God's common grace, which we're going to talk about in a minute. This is an example of God's common grace. And number two, God is in control and justice is his to implement. All right? So he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. I know in my walk with Christ, I've always kind of wondered about that. Why is God so gracious to the unjust? And why, when I look at this, this woman in a third world country who loves Jesus, is suffering so much, and then I look over here on Wall Street, and I see this person succeeding so much, but they hate God. 
God, how is that fair? I don't understand it. Well, the Bible says he makes his rain uh, fall on the just and the unjust, and his sun rise on the evil and on the good. So the first thing, this is an example of God's common grace. So here's what common grace is. In an article by the Ligonier Ministry, talking about this common grace, says this. God's preservation of his creation is part of his work of providence, his whole creation. This is the work of God's providence. But it also reflects what theologians have called his common grace. In general, grace can refer to anything the Lord does for his creatures that they do not deserve. That's a pretty big statement and a pretty big blanket. Most commonly, we speak of grace in a salvific sense, in salvation sense, right? In a salvific sense, in a manner that refers to God's gift of salvation to undeserving sinners. However, our creator also shows grace in a non-salvific sense. He gives gifts to undeserving sinners that do not result in their salvation. Such gifts are bestowed by his common grace. Whether we have been reconciled to our creator or not, as creatures, we are owed nothing from our creator. We take the regularity of the nature for granted, the sun and the rain that make it possible to grow crops that allow us to to feed, clothe, and shelter ourselves, but the sun and the rain should not be taken for granted for they are gifts from God's hand. And he is so exceedingly gracious that he gives these gifts to people regardless of whether he has adopted them as his children in Christ. Did you hear that? So this is common grace. God's common grace is God's common mercy. This idea of God's common grace and common mercy is he the sun rises on the just and the unjust, and he pours down rain on the just and the unjust, the good and the evil. For sure he does. An example of God's common grace is right now. God's common grace all over the world today sustained people breathing all night long. God's common grace has allowed you to be sitting in this room right now, some of you with your eyes open. God's common grace Right as you're sitting here, your body is working, you're breathing, your lungs, your heart, your organs, everything is working, your brain, everything, it's God's common grace. He is sustaining you because he could smite you and me in the snap of his fingers that fast. But God's common grace, so there are maybe even people in this room who are not followers of Jesus, who are not walking with Christ, who have not been regenerated and are saved. Yet God has sustained you and maybe even brought you in here for the very purpose to hear the message this morning. I would say yes. But it's God's common grace. His common grace is for all humankind, even for those who hate him. He still sustained them. Because if, if he didn't sustain them, they would be what? They would be dead. This is his common grace. Right? He's given us life. He's given us air all over the world. And God doesn't owe any of us anything. Does he, how dare you sit in your chair or I stand here and think that God owes me the very breath that I breathe? He doesn't owe it to you. He simply is exercising his mercy in your life that you're breathing today and that I'm breathing. So that's number one. This is an example of God's common grace. This statement of just uh, sun rising on evil and good and rain coming down on the just and the unjust. And then number two, God is in control and justice is his to implement. So he says, I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Because I am in control, says God, he's in control of justice and it's his to implement. Therefore, what should we do? We leave his righteous judgment up to him. It's not my job. My job is to love them. That's what the Bible says. Why? Because he's sovereign over all. He's sovereign over the just, and he's sovereign over the unjust. And he will do right justice. Trust me. God will do right justice. He doesn't ever miss it. He doesn't ever skip a beat. God never misses righteous judgment. He does, one doesn't fly by him and go, oh, man, I didn't know about that. Oh, that person that really hates me or really persecuted those people, man, I missed that one. I didn't catch that one. No, God's righteous judgment is perfect, and nothing gets by him. He doesn't miss a single thing. He will not, any, he will not let anything or anyone go unpunished or unrewarded. 
Not one person, not one situation will go unpunished or unrewarded according to God. This includes you, this includes your enemies, it includes the enemies of God. God's completely in control of it. So because of God's common grace upon all mankind, the just and the unjust, and because he is completely in control of his righteous judgment, Jesus says, don't worry about those who oppose him. Don't worry about those who oppose him. And then Jesus says, don't worry about those who oppose you. Don't worry about those people because God misses nothing. God knows and God is fully aware and he is fully in control and he will execute his justice. So I've been asked how I handle when someone comes into my office at the rescue mission. So I've been asked, well, how do you handle when someone comes in and they're just like cursing up a storm? And then they'll even, they'll even use God's name as a curse word. They'll even use God's name as a curse word. How do you, how do you handle that, Murray? I said, well, I just let them go. I just love them. I try. I mean, I'm imperfect in it, but I try. I don't go, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't say that. This is a rescue mission, and we are faith-based. This is gospel-centered. Did you not know that? And you're sitting in the chaplain's office. <laughs> you can't say that here. And even when they curse God, when they use God's name in vain, I don't react. Now, as I've gotten to know them a little better, I say, hey, can you stop using God's name as a curse word? Can you use it? And you know what? Nine out of ten times, man, they're super respectful about it. But it's not my job to judge them. My job is to love them. Do you think God's sitting there going, Murray, man, I need you. Stand up for me. Would you stand up for me? They're cursing my name. No, he doesn't need me to do that. You know what he needs me to do is just love them, love them. And then I respectfully say, hey, you know, you don't need to use God's word as a a curse word or his name as a curse word. And they respectfully say, yeah, you're right. I don't need to. Do you see? So this is a picture. This this is not my job. God is in control. My job is to love that person. I have to trust that God is in control and that nothing goes unnoticed to God. Nothing goes unnoticed. And this is people who are even enemies of God, maybe enemies of me as I sit there, and they persecute his name. So what about those who persecute me, persecute you, and are your enemies? What about those? Well, this is what Jesus is saying. He says, just love them. Just love them. This is what leads to the main point of the message this morning, is agape them. You love them is what Jesus says. You have heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. What? That's ridiculous, Jesus. Why do you keep doing this to us, Jesus? Every time we're reading the Sermon on the Mount, you keep just raising the bar and raising the bar. This is impossible for us to do. Exactly. It is impossible. It is impossible to do this. So Jesus gives us two examples of normal, ordinary love. Okay? Normal, ordinary love. The normal, ordinary love says this. Jesus says, loving those who love you, that's normal, ordinary love. Loving those who love you and loving your brothers and your sisters. So look at verses 46 and 47 in this passage. It says this. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Verse 47. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? These are his two examples. He's talking about loving, uh, loving those who love you. That's easy to do. And he's talking about brothers and sisters. And this, this idea of brothers and sisters literally is your biological brothers and sisters. So number one, loving those who love you. He says even the tax collectors, the most hated people in that time period, even they could do that. They were hated and even they could love those who love them. That's normal, ordinary love. That love is easy. This love is self-serving. This love is expected. It's an expected love. Loving those who love you, even non-believers and criminals and pagans and God-haters and atheists do this. And then number two, Jesus uses a second example of this normal, ordinary love, which is biological love. Verse 47, and if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? The word used here for brother is adelphos, which is translated as biological brother or sister. 
Philadelphia or Philadelphos is the word used in the New Testament when it's talking about Christian brother or sister. But here, the Bible uses, the writer uses the word for biological brother or sister. Jesus is saying, if you love or greet only your biological brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles do this, he says. Basically, normal, ordinary love of others, including your biological family, is nothing special. It's to be expected, of course. Of course you do this. Everyone does this. That's easy, Jesus says. That's not, that's not the kind of love I'm talking about. I'm talking about a deeper love. I'm talking about raising the bar kind of love. right? The kind of love Jesus is speaking about here in the Sermon on the Mount, it's an extraordinary love. It's an extraordinary kind of love. It's an unexpected love. It's a hard-to-do kind of love. It's a selfless kind of love. It's what? It's an agape love. Those who love with this kind of love, Jesus says this in this passage, they'll be called sons of your Father who is in heaven when you love with this kind of love. You'll be considered sons of your Father who is in heaven, verse 45. You're the ones who represent Jesus. You're You're those who are counted as saved. You're called the children of God. Turn with me to Romans 8, 14 through 16. We'll quickly go through this little passage. Romans 8, 14 through 16. Verse 14 says this. Paul speaking here says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Remember those who have this kind of love, they're going, to, they're going to be considered children of God. They're going to be considered sons and daughters of God. It says this, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So those who are led by the Spirit, look at verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit are those who love with agape love. For all who are led by the Spirit are called sons of God. Those who love with agape love, in Matthew chapter 5 says, will be called sons of God or sons of your Father in heaven. Do you see? It's the Spirit. It takes the Spirit in us to have this kind of agape love. He says, those who love like this will be called and counted as sons of the living God. And then he says, but if you're not going to love others with godly love, if you're not going to love others with agape love, if you're going to be just like the tax collectors and the Gentiles and not go beyond this ordinary love, if you're going to refuse to love with the love that gives Uh, that gives asking nothing, if you're going to refuse to do this, you're going to refuse to have this agape love that gives asking nothing in return. You refuse to do that. This true definition of what unconditional love. You refuse to do that? Listen to what Jesus says. Verse 48. He says, well, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Why in the world does Jesus insert this in this Sermon on the Mount as the last verse? He says, well, you, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If you're refusing to love with agape love, and you're just going to have an ordinary kind of love, and you're refusing to, to give this love without asking anything in return, well, then you know what? You're out on your own. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect like God. It's impossible according to the Bible, right? Where do you know this? Well, that's what Jesus says. You must be perfect then. Or you can receive this agape love. You can receive the love of God, this agape love, so that you can give the agape love. Or try to do it on your own and try to be perfect. If you're not going to receive this agape love and you're not going to give this agape love, well, then you have to be perfect. You want to get to heaven on your own? Be perfect. Have at it, Jesus would say. Or receive my agape love. And then you better give my agape love or be perfect. Be perfect. So this alternative is agape love. You know, the latest, I think it's the latest, at least it is on the radio I listen to, the Chris Stapleton song, The Millionaire. I love it, man. I love it. I'm not going to sing it for you. I'd like to sing it for you, but I can't do it, all right? Right? But they say love is more precious than gold. It can't be bought and it can't be sold. I got love enough to spare. That makes me a millionaire, he says. 
But I love it. I mean, I'm always in my house just, you know, I'm trying to make my voice kind of scratchy like his. I don't wash my hair, and I wear that hat with feathers in it. So love is more precious than gold. It can't be bought, and it can't be sold. I will never be a millionaire in, God, in, in the world's economy. I'm pretty sure. I don't play the lottery, and I don't see money just raining down. All right? So I'm probably not going to be a millionaire in the world's economy. Some of you, you might be. Some of you might be right now, and some of you might become millionaires. But what I am, and many of you are, and many of you might become, is a millionaire in the economy of God. I'm a millionaire in the economy of God. This is agape love. This love God has given me makes me even more than a millionaire. Makes me more than that. It's a love that that truly is more precious than gold. And it truly is a love that can't be bought. There's nothing that I can do or you can do for that love. You can't buy that love. And this love can't be sold, right? It's given to us for free, and we freely give it out. We don't sell it. You don't have to earn this kind of love. I'm just going to give it to you. So first off, it's a love that comes only from God. It only comes from God. It's, it's his agape towards us. It's an extraordinary kind of love. It's a love that he gives to us. It's a love that we don't deserve. It's a love that can't be earned. It's a love that gives, a love that stoops down into the depths of man's wretchedness. It's a love that rescues the sinner from the hooks of hell. That's the agape love of God. And secondly, because God gives this unearned love to us, he commands us in this passage, he commands us to give this love to others. We give agape to others. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Who is your enemy? Who is your enemy? Who are those who persecute you? It's different for everyone, I'm sure, in this room. For some, it's a person who has hurt you. It's a person who has hurt you, who's abused you, who called you worthless, who told you that you're good for nothing, maybe when you were a kid. Maybe they were ab- it's a person who was absent in your life, maybe a, a deadbeat dad or an abusive mother. For some, it's a person who, who has wronged you, who has wronged you. Maybe they wrongly accused you of something or they've taken advantage of you or they, they took something from you. For some of you, it's a person who, who has humiliated you. That's your enemy. Somebody who has hu- humiliated you uh, maybe when you were young, maybe recently. Maybe when you had braces, when you had braces when you were a kid. When I was a kid, they called it a uh, metal mouth. Now my daughter wants to have braces. Weird. I don't, maybe it's cool now. But when I was a kid, it was not cool to have braces. It's called a metal mouth. Maybe when someone, it's a person who, who noticed your first pimple, made fun of you at school. Boy or girl spread rumors about you. When I was a little kid, man, I was a, I was a redhead. I was a fire engine orange redhead. And you know what people said to me? They called me a Cheeto head. And it wasn't the hot Cheetos. We didn't even have hot Cheetos. It was the orange Cheetos. They called me a Cheeto head, or they called me, they called me a carrot top. When I was real little, they called me Dumbo because my ears were huge. And my head and my neck and my body hadn't grown into them yet. You older folks in here, you know who this is. I looked a lot like Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine. Huh? Some of you know, know that cover, Mad Magazine. You're going to look it up. Alfred E. Newman, that's exactly what I look like. So maybe that's our enemy. We've got to think, who are our enemies? Who has persecuted us? Who do you need to love with agape love? For some of you, it's that that VDP in your life. You know what a VDP is? I've said it here before. It's a very draining person. You have a VDP in your life, and they just seem to, they they will not go away. It follows you like a shadow. That person in your life who seems to, to always be a taker. They seem to suck the life out of you. Maybe that's who you need to love. For some, it's a person who has hurt one of your loved ones. Maybe a tragic event like a drunk driver killing someone that you love or maybe 
even a malpractice by a doctor. You need, to, you need to love them. The list just goes on and on and on, even represented in this room. The list goes on and on and on. Jesus is saying to you that it's not only possible to love them, but you must love them. It's not just possible, but you have to do it. You have to do it. You have to love them. And then he says, and you have to pray for them. Let me tell you, those people that you picture who are your enemies, if you would pray for them, if you would even begin the process as, you know what, God, I don't know if I can love them yet, but I'm going to start praying for them. I promise you, God's going to change your heart to love them. He's, you're going to love them. You're going to agape them. You're going to give them love even though they don't deserve it. You're going to give them love even though they haven't earned it. And once again, as it has been said throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount, this is impossible without an abiding relationship with Jesus. It's impossible to do. So don't try to do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. I cannot do it on my own. Without an abiding relationship in Christ where the Holy Spirit is the one who leads my life, I cannot love my enemies. That would be impossible to do. So it's only made possible for the believer who's been set free from the bondage of their sin. They've been set free from the bondage of guilt. They've been set free from the bondage of shame. They've been set free from the bondage of insecurity. They've been set free from the bondage of unforgiveness. That's the only way it's possible, through the Holy Spirit. And it's only made possible for someone who recognizes that their identity is in Christ. When Jesus says these things, and he says, listen, you need to actually love your enemies. It's only made possible when someone recognizes that their identity is in Jesus. And they say, yes, I am a son or a daughter of the Most High King. I am a royal priesthood. I am a prince. All of you men that are saved, you are considered a prince by God. And all of you women out there, you are considered a princess. That is your identity in Christ. That's what the Bible says. So it is only made possible for you to love your enemies when you recognize your identity is in Christ and your identity is in God. It's not in this world. It's not even in the hurt that was inflicted upon you. It's in Christ. That's the only way to have agape love. That's the only way to give it. And this can only happen when we admit that we can't do it on our own and that we desperately need Jesus to do it. We can't do it on our own. Listen to what... What Jesus declares in Matthew 19, 26, he says, With man this is impossible. With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. It is really possible. I know you might be sitting here thinking, there is no way, Murray. You have no idea what somebody did to one of my loved ones. You have no idea what, what somebody has done to me. You have no idea the scars that are deep. You have no idea. Well, I'm telling you, it is possible in Christ. Jesus wouldn't say it. He wouldn't say, love your enemies, if he, if he didn't think he could, you could do it. And he would give you the power. He says, this is impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. So this is why Jesus declares to his children, hey, children, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Our only response to, to Jesus' words is to, is to love them. This is our only response when we leave this room, is that we would love them. It's not possible otherwise. So what I want you to do, I, we're going to do a little exercise here. I want everybody to just close your eyes. Everybody just close your eyes, please. I'm not going to come and poke you or anything. But just close your eyes. Just to spend a little moment. Just put a little bubble around yourself right now. And I want you, in your mind's eye, I want you to picture that person that came to mind during this part of the message of your enemy. Just picture him. Maybe it's somebody you haven't forgiven. Maybe it's a a father, a mother, a relative, someone when you were a child, I want you to keep your eyes closed and I want you to picture that person and I want you to put their face right in front of you right now. Just put their face right in front of you right now. And I want you to begin the process of forgiving them. I want you to look at them in the eyes, and I want you to begin the process of forgiving them. I want you to begin the process of loving them. And it might start by you looking at that face right now and saying, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. And as you begin praying for those people, you'll see God begin to work on your own heart that you're actually able to love your enemy. That's what Jesus says for us to do. Keep your eyes closed, and I'll finish us in prayer. Father, we recognize that this is impossible for us to do without you. And Jesus, we take your words as a serious 
command. It's not a suggestion, as we've said before, but a serious command that we would love our enemies and we would pray for those who persecute us, an impossibility on our own to do. Some of the wounds in this room are so deep. The crevices, they're trenches. And the scars are still, there's still an infection underneath that scab. God, I pray that you would begin removing the scab, rem- removing that, that bandage that is not sufficient to clean that wound and to heal that wound. Would you remove it from our hearts, from our minds, the wounds that are deep-seated inside of us? Would you remove it and begin to do some work inside there? Remove that infection and then begin the healing process. God, we know it is impossible to do without you. There might be people in here, God, that don't even know what it means to have a relationship. They're saying, I cannot do that. And why? Because they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They have not repented of their sins and believed in the gospel and cried out for mercy. God, I pray for them today that they would do that, that they would no longer kick against that, that they would hear your word. You would take your word and you would cut it to their heart and they would say, they would cry out, what must I do to be saved? And God, you would meet them right where they're at. You would save them today. Maybe they would have questions. So as Katie and I stand in the back, that they would come and and say, I have questions about this. Or I just need prayer. Maybe there's people in here, Lord, that just want some private prayer. They'd come back in the back with Katie and I. Nothing special about that except that we get to carry one another's burdens. The Bible says we pray for one another. So why? So there would be healing. We confess our sins to one another, so there would be healing. Uh, Lord, and then as Austin comes up to give us communion, Lord, would we just continue with the heart of worship? And as we're sitting here in our own chairs and the lights are dimmed and the music's playing and we have this time to sit and to contemplate these wounds that are in our heart and wounds that are in our soul, Lord, would we just cast that upon the cross? Before we'd even go commune with you, we would just ask you, Lord, is there, are we an enemy to somebody? Is there someone in here who's been an enemy and we need to go say, man, I'm sorry, I've been an enemy. Forgive me for that. Lord, you do work in us this morning. Jesus' name, amen.